I've taken my title for this episode from philosopher John Gray. Gray's a British thinker. He's gone through many intellectual phases in his life. Most recently, a, he's a postmodernist. This is from his book, Enlightenment's Wake. Quote, we live today amid the dim ruins of the Enlightenment project, which was the ruling project of the modern period. Unquote. So I want to focus today on our contemporary pessimists and cynics, especially our postmodern ones. And what we find is a persistent claim that our culture is a failure. Right? We live in its ruins, and those ruins are in the decline phase and perhaps have reached their nadir. But behind those assessments of uh, dismal practical results, there's a theory, a lot of theory. And postmodernism is uh, often cited as the most vigorous version of that theory, prominent in the last couple of generations. Here's uh, Richard Rorty, for example, indicating the theory that's behind John Gray's postmodern assessment. Quote, the postmodern task is to figure out what to do now that both the age of faith and the enlightenment seem beyond recovery. That's from Rorty's Consequences of Pragmatism book. And he's asking us to take a big picture perspective here, the age of faith being essentially the medieval period from the fall of Rome on through Renaissance and Reformation, about a thousand years or so. That entire project was a failure. Then we got into the modern world and the Enlightenment as a capstone intellectual movement. But that whole modern Enlightenment framework also, according to Rorty, seems to be beyond recovery. So what we are is at the tail end of a historical intellectual era that has failed both in theory and in practice. And to bring in one more postmodern intellectual, here's Michael F Michel Foucault, rather, speaking in metaphorical terms about the earthquake that we are experiencing. Of course, earthquakes are enormously destructive, but as he puts it here, the, quote, the deepest strata of Western culture have been exposed and are once more stirring under our feet, unquote. Now that's from Foucault's The Order of Things, and those of us who are especially aware from a postmodern intellectual perspective, we can take the metaphor in, uh, in both ways. One is that if we survey the ter territory, it's like an earthquake has gone through, and we see the devastation of the earthquake all around us in our culture. But then at the same time, by examining the strata that the earthquake is exposed, we can get down to the fundamental philosophical roots or intellectual roots that have been exposed as a result. Now, there's any number of other people who are pessimistic about contemporary culture, and they come from a wide variety of philosophical and religious outlooks. But our POMO-inspired, or that's to say postmodern-inspired subtext sectors of our culture seem to make a fetish out of how awful things are these days. Now, first question, though, is by what standard are we supposed to measure how bad or awful or not so bad current culture is? Uh, and, and to what extent are we going to blame the Enlightenment for that? Now, one standard is to say, well, the Enlightenment has been the dominant intellectual and cultural framework of modern times. And it simply did not live up to its promises. Now, uh, one weaker way to put this claim is to say that we are just impatient at the slowness of the progress. So the Enlightenment made a lot of promises, but that was a couple of centuries ago. And in historical time and cultural time, we are just finding we're just not getting close to what the Enlightenment promised. Now, at the same time, we have to recognize that there's not going to be any instant perfection. Of course, we can look back at the Enlightenment, say lots of the Enlightenment figures were partial adopters of Enlightenment promises and Enlightenment principles. And of course, there are in any generation, in any mo movement, some people who are hypocrites who uh, will say one thing and, and do another. 
But we also should recognize that it takes time for the genius intellectuals or the brilliant intellectuals to articulate a new vision, for a significant number of them to convince a number of other uh, smart and vigorous people to get active and to put together intellectual movements. It takes time for those movements to be translated into social activism in cultural and political form. And then it always takes time for that cultural and political change actually to occur. So one thing that we can find is, you know, we might say the Enlightenment had some pretty good promises, but it just has failed to deliver on the goods. And we've given it a couple of centuries. So the Enlightenment's a failure in that respect. Now, another weaker claim would be to say that the Enlightenment really has a mixed bag of principles uh, and, and follows through. And so what we should do is recognize when we're surveying our current intellectual framework that really we live in, uh, in an Enlightenment world and we should expect uh, a, a mixed bag of results. But notice that that's not what John Gray and Michel Foucault and Richard Rorty are suggesting. What they are suggesting is that we have made no progress or that we have made the opposite right, of progress, right? that the entire project has been a failure and that uh, it has resulted in dim ruins and that we live amid its earthquake destructiveness. So the other possibility that we need to consider here is that what we have is a group of people who believe that what the Enlightenment stood for was wrong in the first place. Perhaps it was even a fraud. So that whatever we do when we're assessing its results, we always are going to be in a position of rejecting it fundamentally. Now, what we should first do, though, is ask what exactly did the Enlightenment project promise? What were its principles? When exactly are we talking about? And essentially, we're talking about the long 1700s. In my view, we should go back to the 1680s, perhaps run it through around 1815. That's my judgment about when the Enlightenment era most stands out. So why the 1680s? Well, 1680s, we have Isaac Newton publishing, Principia Mathematica, kind of a mature work in philosophy of science and in science, particularly physics. And we have John Locke publishing, the mature philosophical outlook. And those two, I think, more than anybody, stand for a mature, new, modern intellectual framework. In both uh, the case of Locke and Newton, we have people who made work for generations of intellectuals and were, were, uh, were dominating. If we go to the other end of the Enlightenment era framework, I like to choose 19, or 1815. By then, the Industrial Revolution has been in full swing for almost half a century and now and it's starting to crank out huge numbers of goods and is, and, and is becoming a new manufacturing era. The American Revolution and the French Revolution have been accomplished. The French Revolution more fractured and, and a much more negative record, of course, but the monarchy has been abolished. There has been a quasi-republic for a while, and of course, France is going to go back and forth between more monarchical and more republican phases, but 1815 is important because then Napoleon is decisively finished and France and then more broadly Europe can enter into a new era. By the time of the early 1800s, the liberal feminists, the first generation, are publishing and organizing themselves. The battle against slavery is in full attack mode. And so by 1850, clearly we are, are past the Ancien Regime or the Old Regime and on many cultural fronts, the intellectual promise of the Enlightenment is being realized culturally. In his book, Entrepreneurial Living, 15 stories of innovation, risk and achievement, and one story of abject failure, Professor Stephen Hicks has put together a series of interviews with entrepreneurs from six different countries and seven U.S. states to explore the adventure and the hard-headedness of business. In this book, Hicks explores what makes for entrepreneurial success and failure. To what extent does success depend on the key decisions, ideas, persistent action or character traits? How does one's business life fit into one's overall life? And how does one even define success? Our belief is that we can always learn from the accomplishments and setbacks of others. The life stories from others can be informative, cautionary and inspirational as we each strive to more fully realize our own potentials and achieve our own goals. The 16 entrepreneurs featured in this book are widespread geographically as well as in the range of their endeavors. 
From sports to education, to fashion to technology, to finance to advertising, to architecture to cosmetics, and more. Observation of success and failure is often the best way to avoid pitfalls, learning from the mistakes of others to get on the pathway to success. This book doesn't disappoint, providing engaging and useful insights from the accounts of 16 entrepreneurs whose reflections are both personal to them and timeless in their significance for the rest of us. Pick up your copy of Entrepreneurial Living, 15 Stories of Innovation, Risk and Achievement, and One Story of Abject Failure by Stephen Hicks on Amazon.com. And while you're online, please leave a review for the Open College Podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. So the Enlightenment, by and large, promised progress. And this also is a decisive phase. The one cultural marker is the wide number of intellectuals, cultural activists, and ordinary people who started to believe and accept that progress is the normal phase for human beings. And that's a shift from earlier eras, pre-Enlightenment eras, when broad strokes of history or, or human activity would be painted as stories of decline from the good old days, or in cyclical terms, that uh, maybe things get better for a while, but they always are going to decline, and it's uh, either just one damn thing after another, or it's cycles of slightly better and slightly worse, or historical uh, assessments would be one of just randomness. Instead of the random or the cyclical or the decline phase, what you have is a large number of individuals intellectuals and cultural activists who believe in progress. Life can and should get better. Now, this is very audacious and broad claims. And so if we're going to say, well, what do we mean by progress? Progress in what eras? And then we can run through a large number of sub areas. Well, progress in combating poverty, progress in increasing the number of material goods that human beings have access to. That's a quantity measure, but also improving their quality, uh, making them more affordable to uh, broad numbers of people. Another broad area of progress would be in health, improving nutrition, improving hygiene, improving the quality of medical care and access to medical care, looking at numbers such as life expectancy numbers. Another area of project uh, progress would be education, just uh, increasing literacy rates so people can have the ability to read the kinds of materials that are going to improve their minds and give them knowledge. The sheer availability of books and magazines and newspapers and reading materials. The availability of schooling, the number of schools that are open, both for children especially, but then also those who are adults and continuing their education. We can try to measure progress in terms of the amount of knowledge that is being produced, scientific knowledge uh, in different areas, physics, chemistry, biology, geology, astronomy, and so on, the amount of t technical knowledge and the institutionalization of all sorts of fields of engineering, historical knowledge, geographical knowledge, a more normatively charged areas, the extension of freedom as one measure of progress. In general, are people becoming freer to live their own lives as they see fit? What about women? Are women having more opportunities and being freed from traditional cultural attitudes and legal double standards that kept them in their place? What about uh, slavery, serfdom, peasantry? Uh, what percentage of uh, any given culture is uh, living in those statuses? Is that number going down? What about attitudes about uh, living, working, doing commerce with people of different religious backgrounds? Are we becoming more tolerant? What about people of different ethnic backgrounds? What about people who have different political views from ours? That's one other important measure of progress. How about peace? Are we uh, engaging in more wars or fewer wars? And not only a raw quantity measure of the number of wars, but are those wars killing a higher or lower percentage of the population directly or indirectly? And what about uh, the whole justice sphere? Do we, uh, are we making progress in eliminating double standards or triple standards? Are we making a good faith effort at uh, limiting abuses of power? Are we trying to engage in due process where we specify how the legal process is going to be uh, administered instead of just allowing judges and whoever to make the rules up as they go along? Now, the point is 
But the Enlightenment was making very broad claims in all of these eras, and now after 200 years, 250 years, we can look at the data, and we do have a lot of very good data. Uh, we can chunk it in the last 50 years, the last 100 years, and the last 200 years, and consistently all of the data show that the Enlightenment promise of 200 and something years ago has been realized significantly, astoundingly, by some measures. Poverty rates, the number of people living in poverty rather than being a large majority of people has gone down to now it's a small minority of people, a tiny minority of people in the developed parts of the world. The sheer rate of material goods that people have available to them, the quality of those goods, the price of those goods, all of the data show quality indicators up and price indicators down health indicators. For the first time in human history, just in the last 150 years, a more than doubling of life expectancy. The astounding increase in, uh, in infant survival rates, of course, is a big part of that. But even if you just look at people who have already made it to age five, once you've made it to age five, of course, then you have a much better chance of living a longer life. But mortality rates uh, for all age sectors after age five also showing significant improvements. Literacy rates from a tiny percentage of the population being confidently literate in the 1700s to a large majority of people being literate. The availability of educational materials, you know, it's astounding, just the sheer number of books that are available. And now, of course, with the access to computers and the internet, an enlightenment project, if ever there were one, the cost of information, the availability and the quantity of information skyrocketing. The number of people living as outright slaves or in peasant status or serfdom status has gone from being a majority of people in the 1700s to now in the early part of the 21st century, a small minority. The number of women right, who are second, third, fourth class citizens, the expansion of political rights, economic rights, access to education, the data is all extraordinarily promising. Tolerance, particularly in the nations of the world that have taken the Enlightenment value serious, comfortable with the uh, mixing of people of different ethnicities, different religions, different races, working with them, sending our kids to school with them, living in uh, mixed neighborhoods and so forth. All of those numbers are very promising. War. Now, of course, this is uh, very hard because when we have wars, they're always devastating. And, uh, you know, just no getting around the fact that war is always extraordinarily devastating. But the percentage of individuals who actually participate in wars has declined over the course of the Enlightenment era. The number of people who have died in those wars has also declined. We've made great progress in intentionally trying to avoid civilian targets, making distinctions between military targets and so forth. And all of that is part and parcel of the Enlightenment project. The justice era, I think data is less good here, but the data that I've seen also show that we are uh, making good progress in, uh, in lowering crime rates in almost all categories, giving people access to the justice system, making good faith and actually successful efforts, efforts in eliminating double standards across various social dimensions and so on. Now, if we're looking for data on here, I would just mention a few. Just in the last decade or so, Inder Goklani's The Improving State of the World, Matt Ridley's The Rational Optimist, Johan Norberg's Progress, Steven Pinker's Enlightenment, all excellent, well-documented books looking at data in all kinds of cultural sectors. And uh, websites uh, like Hans Rosling's Gapminder site out of Sweden, Max Roser's Our World in Data, lots of very good data, lots of very good analysis available to all of us. But... We now have a very interesting issue that we have very stark contrasts in assessing that data. Lots of smart people will look at the data, look at the world, think they're being smart, and come to very optimistic conclusions. The Enlightenment has made good on significant numbers of its progress, and we all will continue to make progress. But we also have large numbers of very intelligent people who will make claims that we're living in dim ruins. The entire project has been a failure. We live in an abyss, and what we need to do is welcome the earthquake that has exposed the modern Enlightenment world for the fraud that it is. In Stephen Hicks's book, 
explaining postmodernism, scepticism and socialism from Rousseau to Foucault. He writes an incredibly crafted and well-argued insight into what postmodernism is, why it exists and why it is dangerous applied in the wrong dose in the wrong place, as it frequently is in this day and age. Postmodernism has been the most vigorous intellectual movement of the late 20th century. In his book, Hicks traces the roots of postmodernism all the way back to the Enlightenment era, where he systematically charts how the age of reason sowed the seeds of unreason that was to follow, making a clear connection between postmodernism to history, leftist politics, and even the ugliness of contemporary art. Hicks presents his thesis with beautiful, easy-to-understand explanations that burn with logic and common sense. So if you've ever wondered why society holds so many assumptions about the world, and you want to understand the chaos of what is happening, Hicks's work in this book provides a huge piece to this puzzle. Why do sceptical and relativistic arguments have such power in the contemporary intellectual world? Why do they have that power in the humanities but not in the sciences? Why is a significant portion of the political left the same left that traditionally promoted reason, science, equality for all and optimism now switch to the themes of anti-reason, anti-science, double standards and cynicism? This book is by far the most helpful resource I have ever come across for understanding why the world is turning into a direction that I just can't comprehend. Pick up your copy of Stephen Hicks's book Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault available now on Amazon.com. While you're online, make sure to subscribe to the Open College podcast hosted by Stephen Hicks himself, and please leave a review for it on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. Of course, we can say part of the issue is going to be that lots of people are just going to be unaware of the data that has been available. That's many people. Maybe there's an issue of journalistic headline bias. Journalists like to focus on the negative. But intellectuals, that's where we're going to be focusing our attention. As you're an intellectual, part of your job is not to just be grabbed by journalistic headlines, but to look at the data, do the analysis, and come to more sober, informed judgment. And there are lots of, I think, uh, good reasons why people who are not necessarily necessarily postmodernist or intellectually are going to be pessimistic or cynical and so forth. One of those you know, non-postmodern reasons for being a pessimist or cynic about uh, one's current cultural environment is that often philosophy functions as a kind of autobiography. Within each of us, we're almost all of us, if we're uh, self-aware, going on an ongoing project of assessing our personal circumstances. And this can be independent of broader political views and broader philosophical views. What is my life amounting to? And we, each of us on different days and different moods, different weeks or months, can feel the pull of optimism and the pull of pessimism going on within us. We have a goal of impartial understanding, perhaps, if we are intellectual and trying to put together a life of personal meaning. But... Circumstances happen, we all have personal weaknesses that we struggle with, doubts, and we have small scale or sometimes large scale failings that can undercut our assessment of what our life is amounting to. And all of this can lead us to use our philosophy not necessarily as an objective assessment of the world at large, but as a projection of our personal assessment of our own lives. So here, let me give you a couple of examples from the, from the art world. It's a, it's a common phenomenon uh, when we think of musicians who can be very rich. They're successful musicians. They're very popular. They can be in good physical health. But when you listen to all of their songs, right, well, their songs are all about sadness, about alienation, about emptiness in various ways. Or if we turn to, there's a I sometimes think of a common genre in novel writing called the faculty follies. And perhaps because I'm an academic, I've read more of these than I should, but there is a whole genre here. And the main character is almost always a middle-aged professor who realizes that he, usually it's a he, is stuck in some you know, mid-level college, uh, has lost his ambition to solve the world's problems or write the great American novel or whatever his career discipline was, and he turns to drinking, having random affairs, doing various sorts of desperate deeds to ward off the sense of emptiness and depression in his life, and so forth. 
Now, from an outside perspective, looking at this person's life, the character is doing fine, right? He's got a good job. He's at a good college. He's in a broadly prosperous culture. He has lots of time to do whatever he's interested in, but his internal psychological assessment of what his life is about overrides that, and that comes out in a generalized projection. So if you ask that character, you know, is the world getting better? The answer comes out as an autobiographical statement masked as a philosophical statement. The person starts by assessing my life and his felt assessment of his life rationally. And if the answer that he gives about his own life is no, then implicitly he generalizes his condition to life in general. And sometimes, of course, this can function as a, a way of avoiding uh, self-criticism. You know, if the world really is getting better, but I'm not, my life is uh, sucks in some way, then there's got to be something wrong with me. But accepting that kind of self-criticism is not what most people want to do. So for a person like this, lots of data and objective data about the way the world actually is more broadly in the culture is not going to make much of a difference to him. Philosophically, he's still going to be feeling the pull of pessimism much more easily. Now, more broadly, there's another professional hazard that intellectuals face in making objective or subjective assessments of the broader culture. Whenever we're doing so, we always have to ask ourselves, are we making data-driven evaluations or theory-driven evaluations. Though my prior theoretical commitments or sometimes ideological commitments put blinders upon me, do, am I subject to confirmation biases? And we always have to struggle with these issues. Now here, an interesting thing about 20th century culture now spilling into 21st century culture is a still a broad truth that was first enunciated by C.P. Snow back in 1959. It's known as the Two Cultures Thesis. And whether one is a postmodernist or not, uh, C.P. Snow's Two Thesis culture still carries a lot of weight as a sociological analysis of what he called the two cultures. Now, by the time we got into the 20th century, what we find is that the sciences, broadly speaking, and the humanities, broadly speaking, have gone off in two very different intellectual and cultural directions. And almost every intellectual comes of age in one of those sectors, broadly as educated as a scientist or as broadly educated as a humanist. And culturally, one then acquires a certain outlook. Facts are treated a certain way, values are treated a certain way. And one thing that Snow noted was that the fact and value territory had been sundered and these two sectors had taken one of those two sectors. So the scientists were looking after the facts, so to speak, and the humanitarians or the humanists were looking after the values. But the assumption, and this is a philosophical assumption, was that it was an either or. And so what you then had to do was look at facts, but not let values bias your assessment of the facts, or you were a value-oriented person, but the assumption was that values did not have a factual basis. And so whatever you're doing when you're doing valuing and working that territory is not being too concerned with scientific fact. And so the scientists and the humanists come to speak different languages, and they use different methods. Now here, this can sometimes come out in cartoon form, but think of the stereotypes that we all recognize of the scientist, the nerd scientist who is wearing his white lab coat and everything needs to be precise and clean and organized. But this is a person who lives his life in the laboratory, but has never read Shakespeare, doesn't get drunk, has never written a poem, etc. Right? Just total nerd scientist, and we all recognize that stereotype. By contrast, think of the humanities-centric person. If you're a well-educated humanities person, but you don't know any math, well, that's okay. Even if you say, I'm afraid of math, or you think that math is completely irrelevant to what you are doing, that's fine. You can still be an educated person. What's the difference between a beaker and a flask? I have no idea, but I know literature. I know the arts. I'm a cultured, educated person. 
them. So what we then have is two subcultures, but each with very different histories, very different worldviews, very different ways of trying to assess themselves in the world that they are living in. And this is in 1959, which is now almost 60 years ago. Now, we also then, of course, have an institutional competition between the two. Who are the ones who are really getting it? Who are the ones who are really doing what the human project should be all about? The scientists who are focusing on the facts or the humanities people who are concerned with the quest for meaning. Now, as though the divide between these two cultures gets more extreme, from the perspective of the humanities, and almost all of the postmodern intellectuals and almost all of the pessimists are people who are coming out of the humanities. From their perspective, science is an unintelligible discipline. They do not have good scientific training. They don't understand the language. But science, nonetheless, seems to be a very powerful institution. But if you have something that's very powerful and you don't understand it, your natural reaction is a fear reaction. We do initially fear what we don't understand. And if you are coming from a discipline that is not fact-oriented, that you think that values are subjective and so forth, then uh, what you will do is project your own subjective and anti-fact or anti-rational assessment in extreme form onto that projection. And if we then say that human beings are subjective, non-rational, irrational, driven by conflicting desires and so forth, and we then say science is developing all of these very powerful tools that these irrational, subjective, conflict-driven creatures are going to be uh, taking possession of, that's a very scary picture. So if you put the tools of science and technology in the hands of human beings as assessed by subjectivistic, perhaps uh, postmodernistic or postmodern friendly philosophical outlook, that is going to be a frightening outlook. Now notice that this is not primarily about politics or economics. This is a philosophical assessment. What do you think of human beings in general from a 20th century humanities educated person? What do you think of science and technology in general, but again from the perspective of someone who is educated that way? Join Professor Stephen Hicks on his Adventures in Postmodernism tour next March in Australia, where he'll be giving you his insights and lessons on the subject firsthand. Find out what makes postmodernism attractive? Why is it so dangerous? How has it evolved or mutated over the years? Does postmodernism have strong connections to neo-Marxism? What is the role of it in cultural wars, campus battles over free speech, political correctness, intellectual diversity, identity politics and the rise of Antifa and alternative right? What other political movements are now adopting postmodernism strategies and how do we resolve these issues of postmodernism? Stephen Hicks will be appearing in four major Australian cities throughout March 2019. He'll be doing an evening talk in Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide and Brisbane starting at 7pm and will be holding an all-day special event masterclass series starting at 9am on March 10th in Melbourne and March 16th in Sydney where he will delve even deeper into understanding postmodernism, its history, and teach you valuable strategies to actually combat it. For full details and to reserve your tickets today, go to truearrowevents.com. Select the event to which you would like to attend, and if you hurry, you may even be lucky enough to get your tickets at early bird prices at a 50% discount. And while you're online, please leave us a review for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. A third possibility, and this one I think is narrower. We do know, uh, and again, this is not necessarily a philosophical or even an, an outright postmodernist framework, another source of pessimism, though. We do know that for a lot of people, politics is the be-all and end-all of their focus. In the modern Enlightenment world, the intellectual debate has been between those who advocate some form of liberal capitalism and those who advocate some form of socialism, often more authoritarian versions of socialism. And socialism has been a leading contender among intellectuals, even if in uh, the actual uh, practical world of politics and economics, liberal capitalism, at least in the West, has been the dominant economic system. But the socialists say that capitalism is supposed to lead to depression and exploitation 
nation in civil and international war. But if you get to the end of the 20th century and on into the 21st century and you're trying to assess the way the world is, it's very hard to avoid a sour grapes reaction. Right? So if the world seems to have gotten a whole lot better, but it's not because of socialism, and if by contrast, uh, all of the places where liberal capitalism has been in the ascendancy and has had made huge cultural inroads, people seem to be doing a whole lot better the way the data shows, that is a bitter pill to swallow. So you can be sort of aware of the data, but your ideological commitment to a certain kind of politics makes it very difficult or impossible for you to give credit to that despised enemy ideology. And so what you will instead do is focus on the weaknesses in contemporary society and look for them as confirmation that your hated ideological enemy system is still failing, still has problems, and that it's that it's collapse that's predicted from your perspective is still going to happen at some point. So if I am asked whether the world is getting better and I have a prior ideological commitment to some sort of socialism, then I want to avoid having to give credit to my intellectual enemies and ideological enemies with respect to socialism. Now, adding to those mix, I think we do have also, though, to say that in postmodernism, we do have a lot of people who are postmodern, first, second, third generation, lots of subspecies, of course, but we do have them committed to a broader ideology that says the modern world as a whole is and has to be awful. They're convinced philosophically that we must be inside a horrible system. So here's Michel Foucault. I'll just uh, use him uh, as, as an example. One of the leading postmodernists, perhaps not the one who has the most name recognition, talking about his project as a whole. Quote, these investigations are not intended to ameliorate, alleviate, or make an oppressive system more bearable. Unquote. Just to pause for a moment. Notice what we're saying, that the system is axiomatically an oppressive system, and that whatever we're doing with our postmodern philosophy, postmodern critical theory, postmodern investigations, as he called it, is not intended in any way to be helpful of that system. We are going to be critical through and through. Now, picking up the quotation again where I left it off, quote, they are intended to attack it in places where it's called something else justice, technique, knowledge, objectivity, unquote. Notice what we're saying is we recognize that the modern world, the Enlightenment project, talks a lot about justice, knowledge, objectivity, and so forth. But what we need to do as postmodernists is, as a matter of principle, attack it, critique it, right? undercut all of those claims. That's what the agenda is all about. Now, picking up the quotation again, quote, each investigation must therefore be a political act, unquote. And another quotation from uh, Foucault from a different work here. The, uh, the sources will be in the transcript when it's available at the podcast website. This is Foucault again, quote, We can and must make man a negative experience lived in the form of hate and aggression, unquote. All right, so that's then to say what we have is an ideology that no matter what data that we show, that no matter what the actual trends in, to the extent that one is committed to postmodernism, it has to be about the negative. One has to express it in the form of hate and aggression. All right, now, none of this is to deny that there aren't real concerns in contemporary society and that we don't face trade-offs. But there's a difference between saying that there are real concerns and trade-offs that we need to face versus this very strong form of pessimism that comes out in the form of saying that we're living in an abyss, living in dim ruins. Of course, we do have to worry about all of the high-tech weaponry that's being developed getting into the wrong hands. I do think we have environmental degradations in some places that are of concern. I do think that large numbers of people who are extraordinarily crass in our culture, people who have uh, bought into and seem to be living the worst critiques of consumerism, people who are uneducated and mad, maleducated and seem, uh, you know, despite all of the opportunities available, to be not making much of their lives, to be uncivil and, uh, and so forth. But the responses to those can and should be balanced to say that 
what we're looking objectively at is the large number of improvements that are there out there at the same time being able to recognize that, okay, certainly there are subsector problems, but we want to make a nuanced, balanced judgment. I think we also should be able to say that when we recognize these problems, we shouldn't automatically assume a pessimism or a cynicism about our ability to fix those problems. We do have the tools, we do have the knowledge, we do have the resolve, we do now have two and a half centuries of track record, at when we are aware of problems that emerge, sometimes it's an old problem that we are continuing to fix. Sometimes it's a new problem that emerges as a result of our efforts to fix some old problem. But we are adaptable. We are flexible. We have the resources to be able to make a good effort at solving them. So the pessimism seems outsized and inappropriately directed. At the same time, when we are saying that we do have problems in our culture, serious problems. It's also important to assign the responsibility for the unprogressive segments of our culture appropriately. While I do think it's fair to say that we live in a broadly enlightenment culture, but we do not live in a culture that is decisively so. We do still have, in addition to all of the intellectuals who are broadly enlightenment in their thinking, a large number of intellectuals who are counter enlightenment. Some of them are hearkening back to what they think of as the good old days, the pre-modern world. And of course, we have lots of intellectuals who are counter enlightenment in contemporary post-modern form. Pre-modernists and post-modernists also have a significant amount of intellectual and cultural sway. And part of what goes on in culture is as a result of their influence, not enlightenment intellectual influences. So we do have an ongoing homegrown intellectual cultural life. And so it should always be an open question when we find some pathological or negative cultural manifestation going on that is real, that undercuts the good news story that we want to tell about ourselves. Uh, it should be an open question whether the blame for that goes to some enlightenment tenet or whether it goes to some pre-modernist tenet or whether it goes to some postmodern tenet. Also, if we think about the ongoing globalization project that involves a significant amount of exporting and a lot of uh, importing. Uh, so if we think about our immigration debates as just one microcosm issue here, we uh, do get the best of the world when we bring people, uh, we allow immigration, but we also get lots of people who are not so good, right, in, in my judgment. They bring alien values. And so there's this ongoing cultural assimilation and rejection that's going on internal to our culture as well. So the fact that something is going on inside our culture does not necessarily mean that the Enlightenment is to blame. Right? There are lots of pre-Enlightenment or anti-Enlightenment people who are exerting all sorts of uh, influence on contemporary culture. All of the above is hypotheses, and I've sketched out five reasons why people might be cynical, why they might be pessimistic about current control. And all of those hypotheses do is identify general possibilities, and all of them are, I think, operative in our culture. But before we apply any of them to any given individual, make sure you get to know that individual very well. We uh, don't want to just call everybody a postmodernist. We don't want to just call everybody a pre-modernist. We don't want to just use broad labels or start assigning psychological explanations when there are intellectual explanations available and vice versa. Each of us is an individual. Each of us has a mixture of ideas that we carry around, general values that we carry around, but also each of us particularizes each of them with different degrees of commitment, different degrees of understanding and so forth. So before we apply any hypothesis to a given individual, it's not just enough to know that hypothesis is operative in the culture and is a general trend. You have to make sure that it fits the given individual. So be very targeted in one's accusations. So of course, it's important to look at the data. It's important for us to, to know the data and to keep up on the data. The data are always getting better year by year. And so use it in, in assessing the culture and coming to a generalized understanding of where we think we are and use that data in arguing with other people about their general assessments of where our culture is. But in addition to the data, right, data is a tool, but you also have to get to know the individual and the philosophy that person holds. 
we do what we believe and in many cases of course people's doing is driven by their philosophical agenda it's not data driven part of our philosophy involves a person's willingness to look at the data or not in the first place so it's always got to be a twofold strategy that one uses with any given individual understand that person's philosophical framework understand the place of the data in that person's thinking and then use the data strategically in one's discussion. Now my view is that we are very far from the dim ruins of the Enlightenment that John Gray is complaining about. In fact, my, my view, we have made astounding historical progress by historical standards, astounding achievements. Human beings have never had it so good. But of course, it is imperfect progress. And it's not to say that there aren't real and serious problems that we are facing. But it is to say that we can put those problems in perspective and that we should, given the tools that the Enlightenment has bequeathed to us, we should have the confidence, given our track record and given the level of knowledge that we have achieved so far, that we have what it takes to deal with the problems and to make further progress. The host of the Open College podcast, Dr. Stephen Hicks, is a renowned philosopher and author. His field of study and insight into postmodernism explain how it has become one of the most powerful intellectual movements of our time and what that actually means. If you'd like to access more information from Dr. Hicks himself, then check out his website at www.stephenhicks.org. You'll be able to find details on his latest publications, courses, and philosophical information concerning business ethics, education, intellectual history, and religion. To stay up to date with the latest from Stephen Hicks himself, make sure you've subscribed to the Open College Podcast feed and follow at Open College Podcast on all your favourite social networks. And while you're online, please leave the show a review on iTunes and Stitcher.